Christians, Christians are weird. Christians are a bit awkward, quite frankly. We're especially weird when it comes to the point of decorating. Decorating? What are you talking about? We're decorating when it comes, you know, we do strange things. We put crosses on stuff. Some of you ladies, perhaps, or maybe some of you fellows are here today, and you've got uh, earrings, and in your earrings there are crosses, or perhaps you have a chain around your neck, and there's a, a cross that is there. Perhaps you have tattoos on your forearms, or perhaps on your shoulders, and there it is. It's, it's, it's a cross. It's usually not just a boring old cross. It's somewhat decorative. You've got, oh, perhaps, you know, a, a rose intertwined with it, or, or something, you know, flowery, or something that's, you know, gothic, or something, but... There's something there to be artistic, right? You know, we as a church, uh, you know, bef- behind me, we, we have had a, um, a driftwood cross, and we took that one down. It, it had been there for quite some time. And then Constantine was good enough to put that string art cross up there, and that was pretty cool. But then when we painted, we needed to take that down, and I wasn't going to untangle all the string, so that's staying down. We are looking for a new cross, by the way. So if I have a carpenter who is interested in building a cross and putting something up, that would be kind of cool. Some of you know, people have asked me, they said, well, what are we going to put up there? And people have told me, they said, let's put something, you know, decorative and something beautiful up there. We'll put a cross up there that's really kind of, kind of neat that way. Hmm. If you go to Hobby Lobby, obviously not today, but if you go to Hobby Lobby on any other day... <laughs> If you go to Hobby Lobby, and I've done the research for you, you go there and you walk into the store, and in that store there is a whole entire aisle dedicated to crosses, different types, uh, functional, uh, you know, primitive, to everything from flowery and quite, quite, uh, sometimes wrapped with scripture, all kinds of things. But think about that for just a moment. Think about what we're doing here, because the cross, the cross is a instrument, it is a tool used by the Romans as a sign of intimidation. It is a torture device. It is something which you use to execute your enemies. Isn't it a strange thing that we as Christians put those types of symbols in our church? I don't know. If it, I mean, I looked around my living room this morning, just I was doing a little bit of a count, and I saw that we had three different crosses in our living room. Three. One is ceramic, one is made out of wood, which has the Lord's Prayer on it in French, and, another, and there's another one that's made out of metal of some sort. How strange that is. Would we, would we take pictures of guillotines and put them on our walls? That'd be a little strange. Matter of fact, if I came to your house and I saw that, I'd be very concerned. <laughs> would you hang nooses from your rafters and say, boy, isn't that artistic? Little tiny models of electric chairs, perhaps diamond studded. (laughs) Once again, Rico, if you do that, right? That's strange. If we go to the first century, the first century, the cross had a very definite meaning. The cross was this. The cross was the ultimate sign that you were cast off, that you were the ultimate loser. Because a cross was a proof that you should not be listened to. It is a cross. The cross showed that you, uh, well, you're nothing. Because the cross is the ultimate sign of, of shame. Paul will describe his preaching. He will describe his preaching as preaching Christ crucified. And he will talk about the cross and the cross, how it was seen by people in Colossians, not Colossians, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, for the word of the cross is foolishness or it is folly to those who are perishing. It's folly. Why in the world do the Christians want to put it up as decoration or as jewelry or things like that? The cross is a subject or is an object of disgrace. It is an object of shame. It is an object of rejection. Now, all of that being said, as we come to our passage this morning, let me have you turn there. We are in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 15. As we come to Mark chapter 15, like I said, we'll only be looking at a few verses this morning. We'll be looking at verses 33 through 39 this morning. And as we do so, what we have here is the climax of Mark's gospel. He's going to come to a, a, a finale here at this point. It is in the context, ladies and gentlemen, of shame and denigration. 
it is at this point that we finally recognize really who Jesus is. Jesus is not a mere man. He is not a, a mere prophet. He is not simply a healer. He is not the, dis, the distorted understanding of what the Messiah is supposed to be in the Jewish mindset. The identity of Jesus, which very much is in the thinking of Mark as he is writing out his gospel, and he has stretched it out, making us curious and curi more and more curious to find out that identity. It is finally and now laid bare at the cross. On the cross, we understand who Jesus is. We understand who the Christ is. Today, as we open up Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 33, we see the last three hours of Jesus' life on the cross. And it is here that we see his final rejection. It is here we see his final mockery. And it is here we see his final identification. Uh, turn with me. Mark chapter 15, pick it up in verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. We look at this and we understand that the sixth hour to be noon. So from noon to three, all of a sudden, <laughs> the world gets very, very dark. You know, every person within the first century understood that changes in the atmosphere or the, or the, the signs of the heaven, things which had changed those, everybody understood that this was a sign that things were not right. It was an ominous sign. Something is not correct. If you were a pagan and you saw that the sun was not shining as it, as it should, you said to yourself, perhaps we have displeased the gods. Something is not right here. It is eerie. It is, it, it is unexpected. You take it for granted that the sun will shine. You take it for granted that the moon will shine. And now when there is no eclipse, there's nothing. Something is not right. When I was a kid, I could, you know, as you know, I grew up in Spokane. And I remember it was a Sunday morning on May 18, 1980, when Mount St. Helens blew up. I remember that we drove home from church, and we had known that the mountain had blown up, but we had not had the big giant ash wave. It had not come over us yet. We went home, we had a quick lunch, and we went to play baseball because that's what you do on Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons. And so there we were, ready to play baseball, but we saw the black mass coming our way. And we had this big giant argument is that the mountain, or is that a thunderstorm? And we decided that it didn't make any difference because that's bad news. It's coming our way. And we went home. We got inside as the black mass came over. And it was so dark that the street lights came on. When it's noon, one, two, somewhere in that time, I don't remember exactly what time it was. I know it had to be after church, so somewhere between noon and two. As that's coming over and as the street lights are coming on, it's weird. Something is no way, something is really, really wrong. And so we see this coming over, and we're, we're, everybody's standing, everybody around the neighborhood is standing at their front windows and just watching. What in the world is going on here? It gets your attention. Here we have Jesus, and Jesus is crucified. We have Jesus who is on the cross. It is not the time of an eclipse, it's not possible. We have a supernatural way. I don't know how God does it, but he is able to dim, and there is a darkness upon the land. I'm reminded, of course, of the, the plagues, the plagues in Egypt. And the plagues of Egypt, we see them recounted, especially this one here, the darkness in Egypt in Exodus chapter 10. And in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 21, 21, we are told that a darkness comes upon the land of Egypt and it is there and is there for three days. And I like the way that the ESV translated, translated. It says that the darkness was a darkness that was felt. It was palpable. It clung to you because it was so incredibly profound upon the people. Here we have people, we have Jesus upon the cross, and it is dark. It is an ominous sign. It is a metaphor. It is a, an actual sign which says bad things have happened. For three hours we see the darkness. The sixth hour has come, it is now the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour we get the only recorded words which Mark gives us from Jesus from the cross. And if you look at other gospel accounts, you go to look at Luke, you look at John, you look at, you look at other accounts, and they will give you other words which Jesus speaks. 
But Mark, because Mark in his theology wants to stress, and we, and we made a big deal about this last week, he wants to stress it's not as much about the physical torture which Jesus is undergoing as it is the rejection of Jesus. Last week we talked about the mockery of Jesus over and over and over again. Now as we come here, we see that it is the rejection of Jesus and the words which Jesus says here are pivotal. Verse 34, And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pitiable words. Here we have Jesus Christ. The only words which we see from him are these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see in these words the sequel, or perhaps a notch above, the great torment which Jesus underwent in the Garden of Gethsemane. So you'll remember, go back, if you will, to Mark chapter 14. Scoot back a couple of pages. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 33, as Jesus understanding that he will have to be the sin bearer, understanding that the weight of mankind's sin will be upon him, will understand the, the repercussions of that, we see that he is almost to the point of overwhelmed. In Mark chapter 14, picking it up in verse 32, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray, in verse 33, and he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began, look at this, began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Two different words. Verse 34, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. Look again. Even to death, look again at how Mark is emphasizing this over and over again. Four different ways he has already emphasized it in two verses. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground again. It is for Jesus an almost overwhelming disgust and, and, and weight upon him in the garden. And three times he will pray and three times the answer is go to the cross. So now as we come and we come to the 15th chapter, we find Jesus, and now he is on the cross. He is crucified. And we see here a hint, a hint of what is most disgusting to Jesus of all things. As he says these words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For what we see here in one sense is a breach in the Trinity, for the Father has, sees the Son and now must turn his face from the Son, for the Son now has become the sin bearer, and the Father will not look upon the sin. The Son has borne the sin, not his sin, but our sin. This is something which has never, ever happened, and never, ever will happen again. The words which we come to mind are the horror, the horror of the, the pain which is upon Christ. Once again, not so much the physical nature, though we don't want to discount that completely, but the spiritual nature, the pain which Jesus is feeling, because it is a rejection of the Son. The Son has come to bear the sins of the world, and bear them he will. Paul writes of this in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For as it is written, quoting out of Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Understand that Jesus is cursed. He is condemned as he bears our sin. I was impressed and encouraged by the commentary written by William Lane. And he says, we need to look at all of the words here and appreciate what we see here. We see here the question of Christ, why have you abandoned me? But look at the first two words, my God, my God. Lane writes, Jesus did not die renouncing God. He doesn't die renouncing the Father. 
Even in the inferno of his abandonment, he did not surrender his faith in God, but expressed his anguished prayer in a cry of affirmation, my God, my God. We have here Jesus upon the cross, and yet he still cries, my God, my God. As Jesus is crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Obviously, he is quoting Psalm chapter 22. If you go to Psalm 22, we see over and over again, we see messianic predictions. We, we, we hear or we read about how his hands and his feet are pierced. We find how the soldiers will, will gamble for his clothing. We see all of that. The psalm starts out, however, with these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a psalm of despair, which David prefigures, and now we see the ultimate son of David. crying aloud. If we were to go, however, to Psalm chapter 22, and if we go to the end of the psalm, we see that at the end of the psalm there is a bit of hope. Psalm 22, verse 24, let me read that for you. It says this, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. The Father has turned his face, but the Father will turn again to see him. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 speaks of a similar idea. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We see here Christ does not cast off the relationship with the Father, but he hangs tight to it knowing that he must go through it, for that is the Father's will. You know, we live in a world that uh, minimizes sin. I think we live in a world which does not believe in sin. We live in a world which, quite frankly, is very similar to the, the book of Judges, where every man does that which is right in his own eyes. If they choose to do it, they declare it just, they declare it good. And since we live in a world which does not believe in sin anymore, they don't think that they need a savior. I'm here to tell you in the 21st century that Jesus Christ in the first century died for your sins. And if you think, well, I'm okay, I want you to think again. For Jesus died a barbaric and brutal death, physically and spiritually, that you might have life. He was cursed that you might have life cursed. Again, we live in a world which doesn't believe in sin. Folks, <laughs> the world needs to understand that it's nonsensical for Jesus to die unless he died for sinners. And that's exactly what he did. We see here Jesus finally rejected the ultimate rejection, not the rejection so much by mankind, but the rejection by God. Now as we come to the words which follow, we see here the final mockery of Jesus. So we have seen the final rejection, now we come to the final, what I believe is a mockery of Jesus. Verse 35. And some bystanders hearing it, when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? They said, Behold, he is calling to Elijah. Now I've always thought, thought this somewhat strange. I think you probably think it's a little bit strange too. He's saying, Eli, Eli, right? And so they think, oh, maybe he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Evidently, within the, the, the populace, they believed that Elijah would come first. And that is true. We understand that Elijah, the forerunner, would come uh, before the Messiah. John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah, but here they're saying, well, may, well, if he is the Messiah, then Elijah's supposed to come first, so give him, give him some of the bad wine, and that'll preserve him perhaps a little bit longer. It's like giving him a couple of Tylenol. Give him a little bit, maybe that'll preserve him a little bit longer, and then we'll see if Elijah will come. The question I have is, this, is this a sincere desire? Is this a, a sincere thing? To which I believe it is not. I believe it is a final mockery of Jesus. They hear it, and I think they are snickering. They say, go give him some wine. Let him stay up there just a little bit longer. 
If he's the Messiah, he'll come on down. That maybe Elijah will let him go. But I think it is a mockery. These are people who clearly, even if they did at one time think he was the Messiah, they clearly don't think so now. He's on a cross. And a cross is the place for condemned and dying people. People who are not favored by God. I think this is more than likely a cruel joke. One last mockery, one final mockery of Christ. We now then come to the final indignity. The final indignity has been done with the mockery. The final indignity, honestly, would be that of the death of Christ. Look at verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. We're 15 chapters, 37 verses in, and Jesus is dead. In his death, it's odd. Jesus uttered a loud cry. What is the cry? You know, we know that Jesus says a few other things from the cross. You know, Father, into your hands do I commit my spirit. He will yell out, it is finished, which is one great Greek word, meaning it's paid for, it's all done. Mark doesn't tell us what it is. It's possible it is nothing less than just an exclamation and a scream. It's strange, quite frankly, because when people are dying upon the cross, they are, in a sense, suffocating to death. That someone would be able to finally give one last exclamation is surprising and, and quite frankly, bizarre. And yet Jesus, with this great last effort, he is able to burst forth and say something or exclaim something. It is a supernatural almost power. And as he exclaims or yells out one more time, Jesus dies. Now, if our story stops right there, uh, we can go home and be done and, <laughs> and wait to die ourselves because <laughs> there's nothing. But we almost immediately begin to see the effects of the death of Christ, almost immediately. Read on. Jesus uttered a loud cry, breathed his last, verse 38, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We see a strange thing which is, which, which is quite remarkable. All of a sudden we see that the, the curtain at the temple is torn in two. Now, in doing reading, I found out that there's two different uh, curtains. There's one which separates uh, the Holy of Holies from everything else, and then there is another curtain which keeps basically the Gentiles out, and so only a few people, and so that would have been able to be seen by the Gentiles from the outside. Which curtain was torn? I don't know exactly. People debate this somewhat. What we see here, though, is that this curtain, this curtain which could have been up to 60 feet tall, in some traditions they say it was up to four inches thick, we see that it is torn like an old-fashioned phone book is ripped in half. That doesn't happen by accident. This is a supernatural activity of God where it is ripped in half. It's interesting when we look at the word where it is torn in two. The word tear here is only used in one other uh, verse in the book of Mark, and I want us to turn there. Go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, looking at the baptism of Jesus, we see the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Pick it up in verse 9. And in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the, in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn, torn open, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am pleased." Jesus' ministry begins with the heavens torn open, and now as Jesus has died upon the cross, that which separates us from God is torn open. Where beforehand we were excluded from entering into the temple, or for the high priest only could get into the Holy of Holies, now it is torn open. Theologically, if we go to the book of Hebrews, 
The writer there speaks of it in, Mark, in Hebrews chapter 10, so turn there with me. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, we who were excluded, we who could not enter in, now that veil is torn. Now we have access. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We who were far away, now we are close. Christ has torn it, and we have entry. Jesus had spoken before that he would be the replacement of the temple, or people could tear down the temple and that he would rebuild it in three days. The temple, the Jewish temple, was the site and the center of cultural life. It was where you went so that you might have access to God. That is done away with. We understand now that Christ is the means by which we interface with God. We understand that the Holy Spirit will later indwell believers and that each believer will be in a sense as a living temple as God lives within them. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We see with the death of Jesus, we see then, we see an immediate change of things. That there would be access where there was not access. But finally, as we come to these last words, we get to that final identification. That identification which Mark has hinted at, which has given us bread crumbs along the way, he now says it and says it strongly. The ironic thing in all of this is that it is a confession and an identification from a source which we would not expect. Verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him, looking at Jesus upon the cross, the man who is in charge of Jesus' execution, he saw that in the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. It is upon the cross. It is upon the shameful, torturous cross where we finally understand what it means. Not that he is the Son of God, but what type of Son of God he is. He is the one who has come not as a reigning dignitary, but he is one who has come to suffer and to bear our curse. Turn back to the first chapter of Mark. See how he begins. See his thesis. See his theme. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We see it only one other time strongly, and that is in verse 11. And a voice from heaven, you are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And now finally from a pagan guard, truly this is, the son, this is the Son of God. We finally get an understanding. And we have seen these identities over and over again, partials, but, but not completely put together. We have seen demons, for example, confess Jesus three different times in the early chapters. We have. We have seen Peter in the eighth chapter saying, you are the Christ. Okay? You're getting close, Peter. We have seen the high priests who have said, uh, are you the son of the blessed? They're getting close, but there's no faith mixed with it. We find Pilate. So are you the king of the Jews? We have here finally at the very end of the book, we finally get Mark's thesis, which is this, is that Jesus is the son of God. But once again, what does that mean? The son of God is the one who comes and dies a humiliating, rejected death. It's not simply a death. It is a rejected death, and it is a death for the purpose of taking our sins. Let 
the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, has just died, has just had the Father's face turn away from him for you and me, for the rebellion of mankind. Every once in a while you hear people, they say, well, I'm in the midst of tragedy, where is God? Where is God in my difficulty? Son of God's on a cross, laid out bare, naked, a hamburger-like back, nails through his wrists, nails through his feet, and more importantly, he is mocked, he's rejected of man, and he's rejected by the Father. Whatever you're going through, as horrific as it is, and I don't want to discount it, understand that Jesus understands. For the word of the cross is foolishness. For the word of the cross is foolishness. It is folly to those who are perishing. That's what Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. But the verse continues. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God. But it is the power of God to those who are being saved. We're strange people, we Christians, who put instruments of torture upon our walls and wear it as jewelry, except for this. We don't look at the mockery and the shame, we look at the positive side of it. For we see the benefit which we receive through the Lord Jesus Christ, for not only is the cross an instrument of cruelty, not only is it an instrument of shame, not only is it an instrument of rejection, but it is also a sign of the greatest love that has ever been bestowed upon mankind. For the greatest crime that has ever been committed, the perfect one, the righteous one, is rejected of man, rejected of the Father. It is done that we might gain life. And so for the greatest crime is also the greatest act of love. It is in Jesus in the sacrifice which he has given the very definition of what love is and in 1st John chapter 3 and verse 16 by this we know love this is how we understand it that he laid down his life for us and as Christians we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers it is a strange thing a strange thing to decorate with crosses, I get that. But when we look at it not as an instrument of torture, and instead look at it, look at it as an instrument of love, all that we can do is shake our heads in bewilderment and love and wonder. For our Father who sent His Son, the Son of God, the Son of God who would die, the Son of God who would be beaten, the Son of God who would be rejected, the Son of God whose face would no longer see the Father's for a time. It is He who died for our sins that we might have life. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never come to the point where you have repented of your own sin, of your own rebellion, today's the day. Today's the day to say, you know what? <laughs> I, I give up upon my own goodness because my own goodness is nothing. It is filthy rags, it is trash, it is nothing. Christ died for my sins. And he went through the greatest crime that he might save me. If you don't know him, I invite you to come and to talk to me that you might be able to come into relationship with the God which truly loves you.